Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, everybody's nice and fresh after the first day of the conference yesterday and that awesome party we had at Cardinal Hall last night. Um, I'm here to introduce Eric Bernhardson from Wikimedia. Uh, he's been with Wikimedia for six years now. And I had the pleasure of meeting Eric at last year's Haystack when he gave an awesome talk on the Wikimedia LTR pipeline. Um, and now he's going to talk about A-B testing and interleaving uh, at Wikimedia. Um, and just a side note, <clears throat> you know, when you hear the name Wikimedia, it's hard to imagine any other uh, organization that does more for the advancement of open knowledge for humanity, really. So uh, the community and myself, and I'm sure many of you in this room are very grateful for all, all of the awesome work that they do. Um, so thank you very much. And Welcome, Eric. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, so this is, like you said, this is uh, addressing variants and A-B tests, interleave evaluation of rankers. Uh, surprisingly easy way to uh, evaluate two different rankers against each other and decide which one is better, which one do your users prefer. Uh, quickly, a little about us. I'm here with the Wikimedia Search Platform team. We serve search in 300 languages, crossed about 900 wikis, which are individual sites that we operate. Uh, of those, though, it's a very long-tailed distribution, just like uh, a lot of things. So really about 80% of search only happens to about 20 wikis, which are probably 18 of those are, are Wikipedias, and there's a couple of Wiktionaries mixed in there as well. We index around 700 million pages. We do, between everything, maybe about 2,000 queries per second uh, across our various sites. Uh, perhaps interesting. Uh, People often wonder why these autocomplete and full text numbers are so close to each other. It's actually because we heavily encourage bots. Uh, a lot of sites out there, they, they do everything they can to stop bots from using their site, and we're all about giving away information. So if you want to write a bot to use our APIs and query our stuff, like, go ahead. Uh, we love that stuff. Uh, we operate six clusters and two data centers, all running Elasticsearch, and it's just uh, our search team is a team of five engineers. This is uh, everything from operations up to analytics and everything in between. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And so I wanted to quickly note at the beginning that I didn't invent any of this stuff. There's uh, some awesome papers out there. This one uh, is where we started at. It's called the Large Scale Validation and Analysis of Interleave Search Results. This is from uh, Chappelle, Joachim, Redlinsky, and you. If you do any kind of reading of the academic research around search, uh, you'll see these names popping up all over the place. Uh, I believe actually the next talk is going to be mentioning uh, some of the stuff that Chappelle has done. Chappelle has also done uh, the ERR, the metric that you might be familiar with. Joaquim uh, did some of the very first work on learning to rank. Uh, they're really, uh, really good authors. I highly suggest reading anything you see by these guys. Uh, they're all really good. So I wanted to start off a little bit with uh, evaluation of search quality. Uh, why does it matter? Is this something that you really need to be doing? Uh, and I mean, obviously, I'm standing here. The answer to me is yes. But uh, the question really would be why. Um, in a lot of cases, a lot of smaller organizations, when you're just starting out with relevance, you might only have maybe you have a product manager that has uh, some queries uh, that they don't like the results for. Or maybe you have access to a, a couple of your, of your customers that, that would really like to get slightly different results. But trying to tune a search engine one query at a time to fix one query, it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. Like you fix one query over here, and a whole bunch of things over there get worse. And so you really need to take a, 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 meth, a, meth, a methodical approach to how you evaluate your search, uh, your search quality and how you evaluate your changes to that search quality to make sure that, that what you're doing is actually making things better and that you're not just kind of throwing changes out to the wind and, and hoping that things, that things get better. So uh, I thought I'd start a little bit at the very beginning with offline evaluation for how you're actually doing a search evaluation. And so these are the kinds of things that we might do when we're evaluating a change to search before we start getting as far as running A-B tests. So we'll run metrics on the scale of result set changes. This means we'll take, say, 10,000 random queries out of our query logs. We'll run all those queries against the old ranker and against the new ranker. And then we'll just run some statistics, like how many of the result sets actually changed? Did 10 queries get new results, or did 10,000 queries get new results? Um, we'll look at how much did those change. Like, was it really just that, that two items flipped in the ranking? Or is it that you have completely new result sets, things that you've never even seen before? Uh, these are important just to gauge what's happening with your new ranking algorithm. Is it, uh, is it doing things different? Is it doing a little bit different? Is it doing a lot different? Um, other things that you'll see very commonly, uh, the golden set, or so-called expert judgments. This is something where you have uh, humans or experts sit down and they look at, here's a query, here's a result. Is that a good result? Uh, these are 
really they've been used uh, for a long time throughout search and a lot of things. But the difficulty with these is that they're very expensive, very time consuming to collect. Uh, it's a very tedious process to sit through and, and try and figure out what was the intent of the user when they searched for this thing and is, and then determining were the new results correct. And there's also all kinds of ambiguity in there because you're really getting what the expert judge thought was the intent as opposed to what the user's intent was. So as a random example, when someone searches Paris, if they're in the right part of Texas, they might mean Paris, Texas and not Paris, France. But your graders may not know that. They may just know, oh, Paris, obviously that's France. Um, and so there's some context that you lose when you're using uh, the golden set of the expert judgments. Uh, another option that you have is simulated A-B tests. These are typically done through something called click models. There's a presentation coming after this one about click models. I don't know if she's going directly into the simulated part, but uh, the idea there is generally that you can feed all of your historical click data into this, uh, into this algorithm and then present it new result lists, and it will predict where clicks are going to happen on this new result list. Uh, these things are all very useful, and if you start doing interleaving, I don't suggest getting rid of any of these. All of these things are still super useful to do, super useful first steps to determining if your ranking algorithm is, is worth even putting in front of your users for a test. Uh, but once you've done a little bit of offline evaluation, once you're comfortable with your ranking algorithm, you'll want to move on to online evaluation. And online evaluation is typically where you're, you're putting it out in front of real users, where you've implemented this in your production setting. You're relatively confident that it's not going to break down. Uh, and you can go through and you can collect usage data on how your users are using the search engine. This, as compared to expert judgments, this is amazingly cheap to do because you're just putting it out in front of your users and you're collecting usage data about them. It's, it's much, much easier. Uh, the other main benefit of online evaluation is that this is going to reflect the judgments of your actual users. So like before I mentioned you have the Paris, Texas problem, your users know what they were searching for. They know if they wanted Paris, Texas or if they wanted Paris, France. And that can give you a little more context and a little, uh, little better results than something like, an, like expert evaluations. Um, one difficulty with online evaluation is it's not necessarily obvious from your A-B test results, was it better? So say, uh, say your session abandonment goes down, but, uh, your click rate, but your clicks rates also move down. Maybe your click rate moves from 1.5 down to like 1.8 or something like that. Uh, it's not really clear. Often, it's, it's very rare that we run a test and all of the metrics go in the right direction. It's common that you know, some of the metrics go in the good direction, some of them go in a bad direction. You have to make a judgment call about what, what were, did the users actually find that to be a, a better thing. Uh, so, when running an online A-B test, there's a number of goals that, uh, that you're going to have for what you want the test to do. Uh, probably one of the most important parts is that you want the test to be blind to the user. You don't want users to know that they're part of an A-B test. Because when they know that they're part of an A-B test, users often do things slightly differently. They might put in queries that they would have never put in just because they want to see what happens. They want to see if this new ranker is doing something different. Uh, it depends on how sophisticated your users are for if they're doing this kind of thing. But, uh, Additionally, you want uh, your A-B test to be robust to biases unrelated to ranker quality. This means that if you're trying to test your ranker quality, you don't want your user, you want it to only be testing ranker quality. You don't want to also be testing maybe like uh, some, use, some subtle UI changes or other things. This, is, this isn't as big of a problem for uh, the kind of online stuff that we do for, uh, for websites, but oftentimes in the academic literature, something that they might do is they might put two result lists side by side and say choose which one is better. But this totally changes the way the user interacts with the search results because now they have these two separate lists. Um, that feeds directly into the next one. You don't want to substantially alter the search experience. If you're trying to evaluate the ranker quality, you really want that search experience to be exactly the same uh, so that you can evaluate just the ranker quality. And I suppose uh, the most important part is when you're running the test, you want to run it in such a way that the clicks that are generated reflect the user's actual preference for the rankers for which ranker is better. So when we run an online test, these are some of the, uh, some of the metrics that we'll look at. Uh, there's lots more than this, but we'll often look at things like uh, the click position. We'll look at the maximum click position because users often, just because they click the first one, they might come back. They might click a, one further down the page. We'll look at how long it takes them, session abandonment, how many times they reformulate their query, all kinds of little metrics. Uh, things that, that, that can be useful to, uh, to kind of suss out what the user's preference was. But all of those online metrics have a big problem, and the problem is variance. Uh, and so variance, 
at its very basic, kind of a, a layman's example, uh, definition of it, it's just how far a set of numbers are spread out from their average value. So there are some, there, there's some more technical definitions of this, but this is probably a, a good enough definition for us. We don't need to, to get too deep into the math. Uh, at a, really, this is, what this is doing is it's measuring your uncertainty. Uh, when you're looking at, uh, at, at your confidence intervals for, a, uh, for an online and for a, the test that you're running online, really your variance is your measure of uncertainty, how uncertain you are of what your, your actual value is. Uh, this is a demonstration uh, from one of the tests we've run. Uh, basically at the bottom here, we have about, uh, about 1,000 sessions per bucket, and at the top we have 10,000 sessions per bucket. And you can see at the bottom we have a really huge variance. These things are really spread out across the whole range of values. And as you add more data, you get uh, a little more distinct splits between them. But even here at the 10,000, those are well within the 95% confidence intervals. So statistically, you couldn't say that those two distributions are different. Uh, you can say they might, that they're probably different, that they may be different, but there's no actual guarantee there. Uh, and so that's why we start thinking about what, what can we do to address variance? What can we do to, to make it a little better? But uh, I suppose another example of uh, of variance and the amount of data that you might need. Uh, so this particular test, uh, this is a maximum click position. We put uh, 60,000 sessions into each bucket here. And you can see that our, our variance or our, our spread here is almost a whole percentage point uh, on, this, uh, on this click at one, click at two. And it's actually really hard to make a search change that is a full percentage point of difference between the thing that you originally had and the thing that you're testing. This particular test it was because we, were, we knew what we were testing. This actually, the control was on the left, so these all got worse. Um, but, so this is 60,000 clicks per bucket. You have about a 1% spread. Uh, if you run a slightly bigger test, this one is 850,000 sessions per bucket. Here you can see the, uh, the spread tightens up a little bit, but these are still about, uh, about 0.4, half a percentage point, something like that. And so you get, you tighten up your things, you, you have a better control over your variance, but, this is 15 times more data than the previous one. Uh, if you have to run a test 15 times longer to be able to get uh, these nice tight variants, uh, that's, that can be a problem for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to run a test for a full week or two weeks just to be able to, to collect their A-B test metrics. Uh, and you can go even farther. So this is three million per bucket. Here, they've really tightened up. These, these spreads are about a tenth of a percent. Um, but it took three million uh, things. This is five times more data than the previous one. This is more than 50 times, about 75 times more data than the first slide. Uh, another interesting thing to note here, as long as we're talking about A-B tests, so this says it's a null test. So essentially, when we ran this test, uh, we were only changing the ranking function. We didn't change the retrieval function. So we know that the zero results rate is the exact same for all three of these here. But these are 95% confidence intervals which means that our, our mean is, there's a 95% chance that our mean is within those confidence intervals. So essentially, with 95% confidence, you know that about one in 20 uh, evaluations, you're gonna have one that's, that's probably out. We've actually just looked uh, in the last couple slides at about 15 confidence intervals. So there's a reasonable chance that out of those 15, that one of these, your mean value is actually outside of those confidence intervals. So in this particular case, the red one almost certainly is the same value as the blue and the green. It just happened to get lucky in this test of three, million, uh, of three million samples. It happens to come out to a value that's lower. But so most I just wanna say, when you run your tests and you get these confidence intervals where things are only overlapped a little bit or they're really close, you can't really trust that, 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 that the red one here really does have a lower uh, zero results rate than the other two. Uh, that's kind of what these confidence intervals are telling you, that, that, that these very well could be the same value. And in this case, we know that they are the same value. And so I suppose it leads to why is there so much variance? Because if you've run A-B tests for other things, like you change the color of a button, you A-B test that to see what, if users are clicking your call to action more, you don't see this kind of variance. And really, the answer for search is, is this box right here. There's a box where users can type anything they want. They can just, they can, there, there are just so many options, so many opportunities for them to do very different things. So because all of the users are doing different things, they're, they're thinking about different things, really your buckets, when you're doing a traditional A-B test where one user gets the ranker A and a different user gets ranker B, uh, they're doing such different things that the variance of what they're doing falls through into your tests, and so you have a very high variance in your metrics as well. Um, yeah. So 
that leads us to, to the interleaving, which is how one way that we've found to, to really address variance. And really the question is, how does it work? Uh, the really big idea behind interleaving is that uh, instead of having users that get ranker A and users that get ranker B, we're going to give all users both rankers. We're going to run both rankers at the same time. We're going to interleave the results of those two rankers together. And in this way, your A bucket and your B bucket are getting the same user behavior. Uh, you're not getting that variance of users doing different things. And that really helps to, to, to tighten up your variance and to, to, reduce, to make your confidence intervals tight enough that you can actually make a decision and, and know that things are actually getting better. Um, within interleaving, clicks onto the, uh, it's designed in such a way that clicks to the balanced list can be directly attributed as, as basically votes to the ranker that contributed that result to the, to the result list. And yeah. So I wanted to start with uh, balanced interleaving. This has actually been around for a long time. Joaquim's, uh, I think he first provided balanced interleaving in about 2003. Um, so this is a technique that's been around for a long time. Uh, in balanced interleaving, it's a very straightforward method where we're going to make a zigzag back and forth across the, uh, across the, the results from the two rankers. And just we're going to, every time we run into a result, we're going to stick it into the result list as long as it hasn't already been seen. Uh, so we start with uh, an example of interleaving. In this case, uh, I guess these arrows didn't come up very well, but this very first row right here, these all correspond to the arrows. And so when I say we're going to zigzag, so essentially we have an A ranker and we have a B ranker. And we're just going to start at Z. We're going to go to Y. We're going to go back to Y. Uh, well, show it in this individual forms. So in the A first scenario, so I guess I should mention, when you're doing balanced interleaving, the very first thing you do is you flip a coin. You decide, is the A ranker going to go first or is the B ranker going to go first? So that's why we have the two separate uh, groups here. Uh, the arrows and the one I'm going to be going over is the A first scenario, but you can always look at the B first scenario and just make sure that, uh, that, you're, that it makes sense. So here, in the A first scenario, we start with ranker A, and we take Z. We put Z into the top of the result list, and we assign it to ranker A. We say that, that clicks to Z are going to be treated as votes for ranker A. On the very next one, we make our zigzag pattern across. We're going to go to Y, and Y is then going to go into the second position, and we're going to assign that to ranker B. We go one more time. We run into Y again because Y is already taken, because the, the B ranker has already claimed Y. We're basically just going to, scroll, we're going to cross that out, and we're going to keep going. We're going to continue our zigzag pattern across, and we're going to come to V. And so in the very next position, you have the, the V result, and the B ranker gets, gets credit for any clicks to that result. Keep moving along. You'll get into X. X is going to be assigned to the A ranker. Keep moving. We're going to have Z. Z, again, Z was already claimed by the A ranker, so we're just going to cross it out, and we're going to keep moving. And we're going to go on to the W. W is going to go into our result list. We're going to assign it to ranker A. And really, this is balanced interleaving. Balanced interleaving is, is really simple. Uh, it really is just this zigzag pattern and keeping track of, of who owns which result and making sure you don't put the same result into the, into the list twice. Um, you don't have to necessarily read this code, but I just want to demonstrate this is actually the entire Python that you need to interleave two result sets together. It's very simple. It's not something you're going to spend a whole week writing and putting tests together and doing all those things. It really is a, a dozen lines of code. Uh, it's, it's something that you can do relatively easily. But balanced interleaving has its problems. So this is an example where the A result set, ZYXW, uh, and the, the B ranker, the only difference between these is that the Z result moved from the, top to the, moved from the top up here to the bottom. And essentially what happens to balanced interleaving in this case is that most of your credits are going to go to B, which means that if your users just come and, and they're not and they're, they're clicking somewhat randomly, or if your result sets aren't particularly great and they're, they're just selecting different things, this is basically going to bias itself towards B. The B ranker is going to come out on top by probability, even if the B ranker isn't necessarily better. And so uh, maybe around 2008, 2009, somebody else came up with another uh, form of interleaving called team draft interleaving. Uh, team draft interleaving is slightly more complicated than balanced interleaving, but really not that much more, not that much more difficult. Um, the, the main thing that we're going to do here is instead of before we, we flip the coin once at the very beginning of the, of the thing, in team draft interleaving, we're going to flip the coin on every round. We're going to do rounds of, of, of assigning things. So essentially, this is the same idea as before, although at the top, what we have here is uh, BBA, ABA, AAA. These are each round of the, of the interleaving. We flip a coin. So in this one, 
We say the first round B1, the second round B1, the third round A1. And that's just deciding who goes first in putting their result into the list on each round. And each round is going to just get two results. So again, we're going to have the arrows on the left here. We're going to have, I'm going to be going over the very first result right here. But I have a couple more examples if you want to look over the slides afterwards and just see that, uh, that you're doing it in a, in a reasonable way that it uh, makes sense. So if we go through the example, uh, very first round, we flip a coin. We choose that B is going to be our very first ranker. Uh, so we go to B. We take Y. We drop it into the, the result list. And we assign it uh, to an, uh, we assign its owner to B. And we go straight across to Z, the highest uh, available element in the, the A ranker. And we're going to assign that uh, to the A ranker. We're going to go to our next one. We're going to flip the coin again. Uh, we get the B. It comes up uh, again, so B is going to be the first ranker to go. B is going to look down its result list. You can see that V is the first one that hasn't been used. And we're going to pop that into the result list, and we're going to assign it to ranker B. A is going to go next. A is going to see that Y was already taken by B. And so it's going to keep going down its result list until it gets to a result that hasn't been taken already. And so the A ranker is going to contribute uh, the X result to its thing. One more round, this time A wins the coin flip, and so this time A goes first. A chooses that W is going to be its next uh, available item in its list. We assign it to ranker A. B sees that Z was already taken, so it goes down to U, drops U into the result list. And in this way, we basically have, uh, we have our result list, and we have who owns each uh, result from the result list, so that when users click on those, you can attribute the winner uh, you can, as a, essentially a vote for the ranker that, that contributed that result. Uh, and so I suppose the question is, do you use team draft? Like, team draft is a little bit more complicated than balanced interleaving. And uh, really, while I didn't go over it here, there are biases in team draft as well. Uh, they're not quite as easy to demonstrate in a, uh, in, in, in a presentation like this, but there are 100% there are biases still in team draft as well. But the question is really, do those biases, how much do those biases matter? And in general, as long as the bias is kind of uh, random, as long as sometimes the bias heads towards A and sometimes the bias heads towards B, Really, that's going to work itself out. It's going to give you a little bit higher variance. But in the scheme of things, it shouldn't have a real effect on your overall outcome. Your, your overall outcome should still be roughly the same. Uh, we ended up implementing team draft because it's, it's only a tiny bit more, uh, more complicated than balanced interleaving. And it's, it's really not that difficult to implement. So, but you can totally implement balanced interleaving as well. Lots of people have. Lots of people have had great results from balanced interleaving. It's, it's super simple to implement. And so the question might be, well, so we have all these votes. How do we generate our preference? I know this uh, equation might look a tiny bit scary, but really, this is just a ratio. We're basically saying we take the number of wins for A, we take the number of ties for A and B. And I should note that what I mean by ties here is users, when they interact with your search result page, sometimes they click a result, they come back to the search result page, they click a different result. So if they click two results, one of those results they clicked was for the A ranker, one of them was for the B ranker, we consider that a tie because the user voted for both of them, essentially. Um, so essentially, you're going to take your wins, half your ties, and you're going to divide it by the wins for A, the wins for B, and the ties for A and B. Basically, this is all of the users, and this is the users that voted for A. We're going to subtract a half off the end of it, and subtracting the half off the end just makes it convenient because now you have a, a value centered at zero, where everything above zero is a vote for the A, is a preference for the A ranker, and everything below zero is a preference for the B ranker. And uh, yeah. So from there, you're going to definitely want to be able to construct confidence intervals over, uh, over these, these preferences. The way that the, the literature suggests doing this is called bootstrapping, which is a statistical technique. The, I'll talk a little bit about how this works, but really, if you're using Python or using R or something else to do, chances are there is going to be a bootstrapping library that is going to be able to do this for you. But as a quick overview, the main idea behind bootstrapping is that we're going we're gonna to take our, our set of users that, and we're going to have them assigned as either you know, a, a win for A, a win for B, or a tie. And say we have 10,000 of them. We're going to sample with replacement, which means that uh, we're going to generate a new list of 10,000 things. And it's going to be based on the original list. But it's going to be slightly different, because each time we're going to collect a, a, different, a different sampling of those results. Uh, gosh, that's not the clearest example. but. Uh, Essentially, essentially, what you're doing is you're constructing a distribution. You're, you're, you're creating fake A-B tests out of your original A-B test to sample what would have happened in, in lots of very similar conditions. Uh, from that, you're going to have maybe you run 10,000 rounds of bootstrapping. So you have 
and then you just look at the bird. You can the easiest way to do it might be to just sort all of the results from that. You run your your preference algorithm from before for each of those those things. You, each one of them has a preference value that comes out, and essentially that will be a distribution of values. Uh, the two and a half percent. If you're doing a 95 percent confidence interval, that's usually from two and a half percent to 97 and a half percent of and so you essentially, you just take your values from the bootstrapping. I feel like it's not the clearest explanation, but uh, you'll have to trust me, there are libraries that'll do this for you in Python and R. It's really not that complicated, and for the most part, you just plug it in and, and it gives you your confidence intervals. It's a, it's a useful technique. Uh, and so the question might be, if so you do this, do you actually need less data to get the same kind of results? Well, from the original paper that I had cited earlier, uh, that had Yahoo and Bing and Archive. Archive is the ARXIV one. All of them found they needed significantly less data. In particular, Yahoo had reported their numbers at between 20 and 400 times less data. And that's huge because they were reporting that they were running tests for more than a month, collecting hundreds of millions, uh, from tens of millions to hundreds of millions of user sessions. And they were able to cut that down 20 to 400 times, run much shorter tests, and not have to take nearly as much of their traffic for tests. Uh, Netflix has an awesome blog post out about how they use team draft interleaving for uh, interleaving together recommenders that, uh, that recommend uh, shows on their, home, on their page when you're, when you're visiting Netflix. They found that they need 100 times less users in a test to be able to, to, be able to generate a preference using, using interleaving as opposed to using their traditional A-B test metrics. And then on Wikipedia, we haven't run quite as, as uh, as, as strict of a thing as, as Netflix and Yahoo have, but in general we see somewhere around 10 to 100 times less data, less users necessary in a test to be able to, to generate a, a, a statistically significant value where we are confident that the ranker is better or is worse than the one that we were testing before. And I suppose all that's great, but only if it's actually accurate. Like, does interleaving actually get you the same results as a, uh, as a traditional A-B test? So this is from uh, that blog post that I mentioned by Netflix. These slides will be available from the Haystack thing, so there's a link down here to the, uh, to the blog post. But so Netflix found that they have a correlation of 0.969, which is amazingly strong between uh, the difference in their, AB, in their AB test metrics versus their interleaving preference signal. And you also might notice that uh, all of their, their interleaving preferences are very tight uh, confidence intervals. Whereas their A-B tests, even though they're collecting 100 times more data to be able to, to run these uh, A-B tests, they're still having much wider confidence intervals on their A-B test metrics versus their, uh, their interleaving metrics. So <laughs> we found the same that on our data that uh, is a really strong correlation between our traditional A-B testing metrics and our e interleaving metrics. Uh, Netflix in particular is perhaps worth noting. They use, uh, they use interleaving as kind of a first step. So when they want to ship out a, uh, an A-B test, first they send, they send a small amount of users to this interleaving experiment where they don't, have to, they don't necessarily have to put something that might be bad in front of all kinds of users. They put it in front of a small number of users. They get a, an initial signal that says, is this good enough to run a larger scale A-B test? And so they, they run the interleaving. They find out if it's a, a little bit better or a whole lot better. And as long as it is looking like it's going to be better, then they roll out the full A-B test, where they're, they're giving tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of users these new recommenders and seeing if, uh, if users really like them. Uh, I do want to take a note. So just because you need 100 times data and you can run shorter tests, don't run your test too short. If you run a test that it just runs, say, uh, in the evening for half an hour, that is not going to be independent data. So an important part of running an A-B test is you want results that generalize to your full population of users. Uh, if you run a test that's too short, that only runs for an hour or something like that, that is not, most likely that's not going to be a generalizable sample of your users. They might be users specific to a particular geography, they might have particular interests. If you're running like say a late night test in San Francisco time, you're not going to get any of your European users, you're maybe going to only get the European users that are waking up really early in the morning. Uh, it's basically just going to be very different. So you probably want to run we at least, we never run a test shorter than one day. And uh, we like to run full week-long tests when we can because we have, in our particular thing, we have very different users on weekdays versus weekends. The kinds of people that are, that are using Wikipedia on a weekday in the middle of the day are very different from the people that are using it on a weekend. And so, anyways, you can run shorter tests, but don't run the test too short. Instead, other things that you can do, because you need 100 times less data, you can run 
more variants of your, of your ranking algorithm. You can run more tests at the same time. You can have more engineers running tests instead of having to give most of your traffic to this one test just so that you can get enough data that you have confidence in your, in your, statistical, uh, in your, in your statistics. Um, yeah. So a little bit about implementation. Implementation was surprisingly easy for us. I should note we already had all the A-B testing infrastructure in place when we started implementing this. And so really the implementation was just how to add interleaving to an existing A-B testing infrastructure. So on the very back end, uh, inside of our application, we essentially have what are called query builders and we have profiles that feed into those query builders. For the most part, running an A-B test for us either means feeding a different profile into the same query builder that we're already using, or it means uh, swapping out the query builder for another query builder. Uh, we're using Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch has something called the mSearch API where you can send multiple searches and it will run them in parallel. So essentially this means that the users aren't going to see additional latency from having to run two sequential searches. We're going to run both searches in parallel. We're going to get the results back from the search engine and we're going to pop them into the interleaving module. That's that tiny bit of code that I showed you earlier. It's, it, honestly, it's probably going to be a little more than that 10 lines of code I showed you earlier just because you're going to have to keep track of some additional metrics and things like that. Uh, and then when we send these results back to the front end, we include that ownership as part of the, uh, as part of the response. So before when we had said that, that certain results are owned by ranker A, certain results are owned by ranker B, that list goes back to the front end and brings us to front end. Front end, surprisingly, we had to do very, very little. The only thing we really did is that we took that data that the back end was sending and we added it to the event that was being sent to our A-B testing infrastructure. So before, our A-B testing was logging clicks. Now our A-B testing is logging clicks plus which, click is, which, which page in the thing is owned by each ranker. And this allows you to go to your final spot for your analysis. Uh, I should note that for analysis, we got help from some of the statisticians at our, at our foundation. It's very good to just have somebody to, to, that is very familiar with statistics to verify that you are doing things in a statistically sound way. It's very easy to... Uh, to make some mistakes that make your results not nearly as strong as they could be. But essentially for the analysis part, uh, we run the analysis in two different ways. We run the analysis on a per search basis, which is uh, an individual term submitted, or individual search to query is submitted by an individual user. And then we also run them on a per session basis, where we, we basically take a user session and we sum up all the votes across the entire user session. And we see over the session, did the user prefer the A ranker or the B ranker? And we look at, on a per search basis, did the user, did they prefer? Almost always, these two things agree. And honestly, I'm not actually, the one time that we've had them disagree, we weren't really sure what that means. That's a, a problem of, uh, of testing. You get metrics that sometimes it's a little hard to, to, to interpret. But I think it's important to, to, to see how these things work in different ways. Uh, we bootstrap the confidence intervals, and then we draw up the graphs that I had showed earlier. Uh, you don't have to do anything like pretty graphs. It doesn't have to be that crazy. But uh, really, like before, we just we plotted a mean value. We got our 95% confidence intervals. We annotate both sides of that. And that essentially is the implementation of interleaving. This took probably about a week of one engineer's time to implement on top of our existing A-B testing infrastructure. Most of the time for us figuring this out was actually just reading all the literature and figuring out how do we do interleaving? Is interleaving a good idea? Uh, actually, implementing the interleaving was surprisingly easy. and so. I would suggest if you're interested to, to take a look into it. Uh, that brings us to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you, and uh, do we have any questions? Thanks for the presentation. Hmm. How did the interleaving impact your operational additional operational expense because you're running multiple searches, and how did it impact your runtime performance on search since you have to pull from two different indexes and then interleave them? So in our case, we probably just a, an artifact of how we run things. We run on bare metal and we only, just, we only allocate money to buy things on a yearly basis, so we are massively overprovisioned. Uh, and so running all kinds of extra search queries like Gosh, the, the, the thing is like we, because also because we have a lot of bots, our search traffic varies wildly. Like a couple weeks ago, we were doing 500 queries per second and then suddenly over the weekend, it jumped up to 1400 queries per second of full text, of full text traffic. And so we just, we have lots of infrastructure available for, for being able to run these queries. And so really 
the latency metrics that you that we see, they basically don't change at all. Um, but that's going to depend on how on on what hardware you have, what infrastructure you have, that kind of thing. Thank you. And uh, do you also see a way to apply interleaving not just to two different rankers, but also to two different retrieval algorithms so that the recall would differ? And then you might need page counts or hit counts. So then? certainly there's, there's nothing particular to interleaving where you have to do just uh, scoring changes. Uh, you can totally change up your retrieval algorithm as well. Um, we do a little bit of testing on that, but mostly we've used interleaving for evaluating our learning to rank models. And in those cases, the learning to rank is just doing a rescoring. I don't see any reason why you couldn't, though, just do uh, totally different retrieval algorithms. One thing you may run into is that like zero results are obviously, if one gives zero results and one gives some results, all the votes are going to go to the non-zero section. Um, so you might have to think about it, but I haven't seen too much. From the literature I've read, I don't think anybody directly addresses that kind of question. Uh, I think mostly they just uh, they treat them as two separate rankers and they interleave them whatever comes back, even if they're very, very different result sets. I wanted to get a little bit of clarification with uh, the, the function that said um, the score of A versus B is the winner of A, winner of B, and the tie. What, what is implied by the tie there? I didn't understand that exactly. Right there. So the tie is right here. So take, for example, we were doing uh, one of the metrics that we run is the, the, the preference over a session. So over a session, a user may do multiple searches. They may, do, they may have five votes for A and five votes for B. Uh, that is going to be considered a tie. That's not a preference in either direction. Uh, and so you can see the same thing when a user has a single search query. When a user searches for something, say they click on the top result because it's the top result. Users just click the top result. That's what they do. Uh, but they look at the page. They don't like the result. They didn't even what they're looking for. So they come back. They look down the page. Maybe they click the third result. And the third result was assigned to a different ranker. So in the same kind of thing, user did a single query, they performed two clicks. If those clicks go to different rankers, then that's a tie between the two rankers, as opposed to a, a vote for any particular ranker. Okay. Max. <laughs> this is perfect. I had a question regarding the equation. So, so um, you mentioned about you guys assign all users to all buckets. Yep. So um, how do you get this equation to uh, all users in that case? So because I don't see a notion of user in the, in the equation. Uh, I guess I didn't include the notion of user. Okay. Essentially, uh, essentially, wins of A is the number of users who had a preference for the A ranker. Wins B is the number of users that had a preference for the B ranker. And the ties A, B is the number of users that had ties between the A and the B ranker. OK. OK. Yep. Any other questions? When you run the test, do you hold out a control group and compare whether or not the, in, the metrics from the grouped interleaved are different from the control non-experiment group? So definitely, we run, we run interleaving and we run traditional A-B tests. Like, uh, I definitely would not suggest anybody throw away their classical A-B testing stuff just to run a interleave tests. But a benefit of interleave tests is we might need to run a week or two weeks of, uh, of traffic, especially on some of our smaller sites, uh, on the non-English uh, sites, to be able to get enough data to, to do a strong signal. Whereas the interleaving test, we can run it really short and get an idea initially, just like kind of how I was explaining how Netflix does theirs. How you can, you can run the interleaving test, get a, a quick guesstimate of, is this thing going to be a little better, or is it uh, not even worth testing? Uh, but definitely, you still, we still have like a regular control group, regular A and B buckets. We still collect uh, those metrics that I had showed earlier, the, the clicks at N, the time to first click, all that stuff. Uh, we still collect those for the individual rankers to be able to evaluate uh, all our traditional metrics. So yeah, I guess what I was getting at is, assuming you have an algorithm that you're testing and you want to do A and B interleaved. Mm -hmm. um, so you could do A, B interleaved for the entire population, or you could do A and B interleaved for 50%, and then 50% untouched, and then look at whether or not 
the, there's a difference in aggregate between the A and B interleaved. In other words, check to see if inter, what's the what's the potential um, impact of interleaving in terms of influencing the overall metrics. Ah, uh, so I had not thought about that. Uh, I suppose lots of those those traditional metrics could still be calculated over your your interleaved thing just to see if perhaps that, uh, that, that users are getting a worse experience with, through the interleave test. Uh, but it's not something that we've, we've looked at directly. It'd probably be interesting to look at, though. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you look at time of day or time of week as when you run the test? So that's part of why I talked about earlier that we always try and run tests for at least one day. Uh, and usually we decide ahead of time, like, is this going to be a 24-hour test? Is it going to be a seven-day test? And we set things up ahead of time so that they start and end at the same time of day. Basically, uh, this is just something that our, that our analysts have really been uh, pushing us on, is just to, to be able to decide ahead of time when your test is going to start, when your test is going to end, and make sure that you have an, an even distribution of people that's uh, generalizable across your population. Um, so yeah, we don't really pay attention to what time of day the test is starting. We just make sure that the test runs for a complete day and collects a full day worth of users. Yeah, because I was just thinking like some, there might be some temporal preference for the users running different types of searches. And oh, definitely. on an e-commerce site, but I mean, less so on Wikimedia maybe. I, I could imagine an e-commerce site, like you might have rankers that work better in the afternoon and rankers that work better in the middle of the day. And uh, definitely something worth testing. But Time for one more question. <laughs> Hi. Uh, are there any other methods which you uh, f kind of uh, narrowed down and like finalized on interleaving? Or is it like this is just an alternate, one alternative? Uh, so these are the forms of interleaving that, are, that went over in uh, the paper that I had cited at the very beginning of the. There are a couple other interleaving methods. There's also a, uh, gosh, there, there are lots of interleaving methods. There are also, uh, I suppose, as, a, as, a, as an aside, there's also some very interesting uh, gradient descent techniques that, that, use, uh, that use interleaving. Uh, but these kind of are the ones that have been most talked about, most cited in the literature, and they're really easy to implement. And so these are kind of the ones that we've went with. But there are totally, there are other interleaving options. And they all have their own unique biases and People have written whole dissertations on the biases of, uh, of one versus another. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah.